Hey everyone, welcome to the Wisdom Seat Podcast. I'm very excited to share a recording of a teaching given to our community by Elizabeth Nyamgyal. This was done during the COVID pandemic when all of us were in lockdown. This was all over Zoom. And she generously said that we can use this recording and share it. So the title of this talk was Women, Wisdom in the Buddhist Path, The Awakening of Feminine Energy in Modern Times. And here's a little more context of, of what this is about. Feminine wisdom, or Prajnaparamita in Sanskrit, is considered the very foundation of all the teachings and practice lineages of the Buddha. You might say that such feminine wisdom is the very heart of awakening, offering us insight into our mind, reality, and our relationship to the world around us. But how can the Prajnaparamita teachings help us engage the challenges of the modern world? especially during these times of rapid social change, technological innovation, and cultural upheaval. During this teaching, Elizabeth Nyamgyal will present how the Buddhist path offers the opportunity to examine our lives gently and wisely and release the liberating insight of Prajnaparamita. A little bit about the teacher. Elizabeth Mattis Nyamgyal studied and practiced the Buddha Dharma for 35 years under the guidance of her teacher and husband, Zigar Kongcha Rinpoche. She holds a degree in anthropology and an MA in Buddhist studies. She teaches throughout the US, Australia, and Europe. She's the author of The Power of an Open Question, The Buddhist Path to Freedom, and The Logic of Faith, The Buddhist Path to Finding Certainty, Beyond Belief and Doubt. I hope you enjoy. Well, welcome everyone. Yes, we will be recording everyone for this evening's presentation. Uh, Women, Wisdom, and the Buddhist Past, The Awakening of Feminine Energy in Modern Times. Our speaker this evening is Elizabeth Mattis Numgel, and she's kind enough to provide us with teaching this evening, and uh, at roughly 7.30, we'll turn it over. And just a brief note of thanks from the Wisdom Seat. If you're not familiar, the Wisdom Seat is a group of Buddhist teachers and practitioners residing in the Mid-Atlantic region who host spiritual teachers, sponsor meditation retreats, and offer support to those in the Buddhist, Buddhist path, drawing on the profound view of the Kagyu, Nyingma, and Rimei traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, the Wisdom Seat seeks to bring those spiritual traditions into our modern, modern day life, cultivating healthy relationships between teachers, students, and reliably transmitting the Buddhist teachings to others. If you'd like to join or learn more, uh, visit thewisdomseat.org. Thank you so much. And now we'll turn it over to uh, Elizabeth Mattis Namgyal. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Um, so nice to see you all. And um, I'm thank you to the members of the Wisdom Seat community for inviting me here, um, especially to speak about this topic: women, wisdom in the Buddhist path, awakening of feminine energy in modern times. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Let's see what I do with that. I the first, when I rephrase it to myself, <laughs> what I feel my task is here. Um, I kind of frame it as what is feminine wisdom and how can it help us right now? Um, I think we're, we're living in wild times and um, we have to make this practical. So I want to try to explore that. So, um, you know, in many ways, I feel that the feminine wisdom in the context of Buddhist scholarship and good Buddhist practice is not that well understood. And we really need it right now. So I think we need to really dig into it tonight. And um, first, though, I, as I usually do, I'd really like to start with a very short meditation. So I will just guide you in that. And I have a feeling that most of you are, are seasoned practitioners, so I don't probably won't have to say too much about it. Um, but I just want to say in, in regards to practice that, um, you know, in, in these times, I mean, the world has always been difficult. Being a human being has always been a tall order for all of us. But right now, I don't know about you, but I feel it's an even taller order than usual, that there's so much going on and it's so heightened and there's so much information coming at us. And, um, you know, it's really a time to step up as well, but it's like, how do you digest all of it? Um, there's so much happening energetically and so on. And one of the questions I always ask myself regarding practice and regarding the study of the Dharma is, you know, where do we find our agency to kind of navigate things in a, in a healthy way? Um, 
And I think in practice, we find a lot of agency. In a way, we don't have agency in terms of what comes up in our mind. You know, things arise due to causes and conditions, and there's not much we can do about it in a certain way. But how do we relate in a healthy way to the energy, natural energy, the expressive energy of our mind um, is something we do have agency over. And it's very powerful to find some kind of elegance and mastery and stability of the mind so that we can actually be sane in the world that we move about in. So um, what I just want to do is a really guide you through a really simple practice. I always find it a treat when people start to meet in meditation. And when I guide myself in meditation, when I guide others in meditation, it's like I'm guiding myself too. So it's kind of a, a nice gift um, of wellness and sanity I can bring to myself as well. So um, I just want to do some breathing practice and I want to do three cycles of 10 breaths. And um, the first one, I just want you to, I would want you to focus just on the, the sensations, the subtle sensations of the air coming in and out of your nose and like around your mouth, just very narrow focus. And then after we finish that one, you can just relax in your meditation and your meditation posture and I'll guide you through the next two because we're gonna expand the focus a little bit. Um, so let's just begin and I'll just um, ask you, invite you to bring your awareness to your body. Um, again, we want to uh, find a relaxed, posture but with some energetic integrity to it um, and we, we can keep our eyes open or closed and um, if we can breathe through our nose would be the best in this meditation and then I usually ask people to put their hands on their knees because I when we do the breathing even for advanced practitioners I find this is really helpful that every time you do a cycle of breath meaning an inhale and an exhale you just gently press your finger into your knee and then it kind of keeps you focused. And then you can count to 10 without thinking about it too much. And then as for the mind, again, we can't control the mind. We can let the mind do whatever the mind, you know, the, the natural expressive energy of the mind will come. But we, we can actually focus. In this meditation, we'll have a focus. And if, if we lose our focus, if the mind wanders off, I always say just rejoice that you've caught it wandering off. because. In fact, if we didn't have awareness, we didn't have the ability to catch our mind wandering off, we would be lost forever. But we actually have this ability to catch ourselves and to have a focus and bring it back. So I always say just uh, uh, to bring it back joyfully with appreciation for that kind of resource and just bring it right back to the task, which is such a simple task, which is doing something we naturally do, but with a, with a very narrow focus. So I have a little gong here and all, and we can begin. With 10, 10 cycles of breaths, just with the focus on the sensations around the nose and the, the, like around the upper lip. Now you can you know, keep your eyes closed if they're closed or just sit, you know, keep relaxing. Your, now I'd like you to expand uh, your focus 
to your entire body and, and your mind. Um, so when you breathe, inhale and exhale, just like before 10 cycles of breaths, just let the breath, let your body breathe, let your mind breathe. You know, give it, it's like opening a window and just letting the breeze come through the house. And we'll do 10 breaths. And now for the last 10 breaths, I'd like to invite you to expand your focus to include, you could start with your room, your environment that you're in. You can um, spread it out to the, your town or your city, or you can expand it to your country. You can expand it to you know, the world. You can expand it as much as, as you can possibly expand it to include um, and breathe through or give breath to, which is such a powerful metaphor right now for us and on every level, to give breath to or breathe through just everything that's going on, just the, the grief in the world, and the pain in the world, the beauty, the natural beauty, the kindness that of human beings, animals, whatever comes to your mind, but just to include that and include that in your breath. It's almost like make the world your body and just breathe through that. So we'll do 10 of those. So I'm really honored uh, to speak about this topic, um, feminine wisdom, um, women, wisdom, and the Buddhist path, the awakening of feminine, feminine energy in modern times. So, of course, I had to break that down. <laughs> um, so let me, um, let me do that out loud, because there's so many things in that uh, title and subtitle to look at. So when we say women, you know, that's a particular gender. So that's one thing. And then we say wisdom and wisdom, um, in many wisdom traditions, uh, wisdom is associated with the feminine. Um, that's like the word Sophia, for example, and definitely in, in the, uh, especially in Vajrayana Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism, um, Feminine is associated with wisdom. Um, 
but it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not wisdom in terms of, I mean, it's not feminine in terms of a gender. So we have to, I'm going to have to talk about that or we can talk about that because wisdom doesn't have a gender in this particular tradition. Um, then the awakening of feminine energy. So that was a challenging um, thing uh, to try to explain to myself when I was thinking, how would I, how would I communicate what I think the awakening of feminine energy is? So this is my own, based on my studies, my very traditional studies. Um, this is what I came up with. Um, feminine energy refers to one in the context of, of wisdom refers to one's ability to bear the rich energy of the nature as it is. It's like the ability to bear witness to the way that things are. And that's often referred to as prajna um, or accurate discernment. So that's going to take, we have to get into that in a minute. Then we have the Buddhist path. That's also a big topic. Um, there's so many traditions and schools and approaches that emerge from the Buddhist teachings, and they all they all actually relate to the feminine imagery and, and, and the feminine wisdom in a very different way. So, you know, if we look at the foundational teachings of the Buddhist in the sutras, you know, we see mostly a monastic community, um, some some lay community. We see that it's more male than female. Um, so wonder, wonderful to have Anila with us. Like for me, um, I venerate the venerables. <laughs> I really deeply, um, to be a, 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 an ordained uh, a sangha, an ordained person in, in this modern age is really um, huge. And um, I, I rejoice. I really rejoice in that and, and appreciate and thank you for that, Anila, um, for holding this for us in this <laughs> time where it's not easy to find support. Um, I, uh, there's so much you can say about the vows and precepts. Uh, there's differences in the vows and precepts for monks and nuns. And that's been a, a, a source of conversation, I think, for many people. And it's very interesting. And I don't think I'm the best one to talk about it. I think it's a really interesting uh, topic. And But um, I won't talk about it here. But I will say a about my experience of being in the nunneries in India, Nepal, and Tibet, that I find I have found them to be the most joyful places with lots of singing and laughter and serious Dharma practice. And, and I feel so fortunate to have spent time in those environments myself. Um, so, you know, in that historically, I don't think that the nunneries have been supported in the way the monast monasteries have been, but I think that's changing. And I always think, well, somehow the causes and conditions weren't there before for th this tradition to serve up, um, to thrive. But my, I always pray that it continues to thrive and that mm, I see that more people support that um, than they used to. And so I rejoice in that, in that very much so. Um, it's really a time for women in many ways. And I hope that ki that continues. So, you know, that's... All I can really say right now about more the foundational tradition um, of who women are. There's some really important women. The Buddha's mother was an interesting figure, and the Buddha's aunt was an interesting figure. And there's stories of women. There's the young girl who gave the Buddha the bowl of curds when he, you know, emerged from his practice of asceticism. There's, um, you know, there's so there's like these characters that pop up, but they're significant in many ways. So. Um, you know, we don't have that much time, and um, I'll, so I'll move on. But it's good to acknowledge that each aspect of the of Buddha Dharma, you know, we're not, Buddhism is varied, and it, it's developed and unfolded in, in an incredible way. So on the Mahayana path, the path of the Bodhisattva, we start to hear about uh, um, feminine wisdom in when we hear about Prajnaparamita, transcendent wisdom, when we read the Heart Sutra and it says, gone, gone, gone beyond, gone completely beyond, we're talking about a principle that's feminine. The word in Sanskrit, prajna, is actually a feminine word. And prajna paramita is often associated um, with being the mother of the Buddhas and the mother of the Bodhisattvas. And it has a particular reason that this is true. Um, so when we talk about prajna, like in 
many of the texts on Prajna Paramita, like the Abhisamaya Lankara, which is an incredible a commentary um, on the Prajna Paramita literature, um, we hear that Prajna is uh, uh, the ground of being, whether it's recognized or not, just how things are. Prajna is also the path. Prajna is the fruition. Prajna also refers to all these texts on the Prajna Paramita, like the, the most uh, uh, summed up uh, version is, is the Heart Sutra or the syllable ah. You know? So there's a lot that can be just said about Prajna Paramita literature, but it's associated with the feminine. And what, they, what um, is said in the Abhisamaya Lankara is that the reason that we refer to Prajna Paramita in the feminine as the great mother is that it's through recognizing the nature of the truth of her, the nature as it is, the nature that's not impeded by misunderstanding, that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas um, take birth. So in other words, recognition comes from the realization of the nature as it is through the practices and the texts that we have available to us. So it's the ground, the path, the fruition, and then later on emerged imagery around uh, Mother Prajnaparamita. Used to be that, there, that Mother Prajnaparamita had no gender. There was, not, uh, there was no image, that no one wanted to make an image because we're talking about the natural state of things. But later on, then she emerged and she, uh, uh, people, you know, when people have deep experiences of something, they want to express it. They want to talk about it. They want to paint it and all the, you know, I don't think that all these things really capture the truth of something, which is ineffable, but at the same time, um, it beautifies our world when we try to do so. And I think we have beautiful imagery of uh, Mother Prajnaparamita and um, in the texts, one of the Prajnaparamita texts, I think it's the Prajnaparamita in 8,000 lines. It says, just as the children of a, a mother um, you know, they love their mother so much. And when she falls ill, you know, they kind of dote on her and tend to her and they give her love and affection. That way, the, the, those on the path who are to become Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they, they dote on the mother Prajnaparamita. They're obsessed kind of with the nature itself and being obsessed with the nature and, and, and gleaning the wisdom from the, the nature and the understanding of the nature, having direct experience, then they become Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So um, this is how she's talked about in the, the uh, Mahayana uh, literature, the way of the Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva path, and so on. So then uh, in the Vajrayana, uh, she, the, she, the, the feminine wisdom is quite interesting and, and very, um, I know this is a more a Nyingma Kagyu remake group, which is great. That's where I am come from too. <laughs> so I feel very comfortable uh, talking about this. and. Um, so, uh, you know, you know, the Vajrayana te teachings are more the esoteric teachings practiced, uh, practiced in a hidden way in India. And then, of course, almost became like mainstream in Tibet um, and so, such an intrinsic part of the culture in Tibet. Um, and what, one thing, one where, place where the Dakinis or the feminine uh, wisdom beings show up is when, you know, you find these yogis practicing and they're not doing it right. And then the wisdom, feminine wisdom beings come in and start to prod them and start to tease them and start to kind of test their realization. Um, and usually uh, they listen in most of the stories, you know, like when Milo, Milarepa was in a cave and then he was practicing and the demoness of the rock came in, which is really a wisdom uh, being, a feminine wisdom being. And she assumes all these scary forms. And then she says, you know, if, if you don't see the nature of uh, scary things, then, you know, you're not really practicing, you know, you should be looking at the nature of all things. And so there was like a teaching in there. There's a teaching on uh, certain yogis or practitioners get obsessed about certain things. Like there's this one uh, story of the one Mahasiddha who went into retreat for like, I don't know, 30 years. And when he came out, he couldn't wait to just eat some radish curry. And she was teasing him, saying, like, you did all those years of retreat, and this is what you're thinking about when you came out. Like, he, his mind was always on this radish curry when he was doing his retreat. So it's, like, playful and interesting. But th the men are listening, you know. The, so there's some kind of expression of respect in that. And it, it's, I, I always love those stories, the demoness of the rock and, 
in the radish curry story. And there's many others too um, that come up. And then there's the feminine principle, which just, uh, we, we have our yidams or our uh, deities, you know, our yidam deities like Tara or Vajrayogini or the black Troma. You know, some of uh, these are the, the yidams that we practice within sadhana or the, the deities that we pray to. We pray because it evokes um, our own wisdom mind. So all these um, beautiful images, and we have Cynthia Amopu here, who's an incredible Tonka painter, who's painted some beautiful imagery of par Prajna par Paramita, Vajrayogi, you name it. <laughs> she's, she's an incredible painter. So, um, but they, they, when we talk about the energies um, or the qualities of these beautiful um, uh, 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 deities or yidams, uh, it's like we're talking about the raw energy before we kind of shut down around it or try to figure it out or know what it is. And we have devotion to these energies, so we're not shut down either. And so we can have this kind of um, recognition of these, these beautiful qualities of our own mind. Because, of course, the Dharma is not dualistic in that way. We're not offering, we're not having devotion for something outside. Devotion itself uh, uh, creates, kind of poisons our mind for insight into the nature of who we really are and the nature of how things really are. And so it's a beautiful um, practice to have an object to appreciate and to, um, to talk to and communicate with and to evoke our own understanding um, of who we are and what, what our world is about. So um, this is where they show up again, the feminine beings. Um, another way that the feminine uh, energies are talked about in the Vajrayana is that if you, if you understand the essential nature of the five elements, so um, earth, fire, uh, water, air, and space, the five elements, the nature of the five elements are the five dakinis or five wisdom beings. Um, so what this is suggesting, and this is a very deep teaching, uh, Chinli Nobu Rinpoche in his book, Magic Dance, has a poem about this, it's quite beautiful. Um, and I would suggest if you're interested to read that. But it's like we look at the world in a very coarse way. But what happens when our mind is completely open and curious and connected and interested in discerning? Um, we, the world looks very different to us. And so this, I'm just hinting at something that I think we need to talk directly about in a minute. Um, but uh, this is the nature of the five consorts or the five wisdom dakinis that uh, Chinli Norbunji talks about. It's very much, a, if you do sadhana practice, then of course you understand this uh, principle. So, um, and then we have our historical uh, heroines like uh, Machi Glabrin who was an incredible 11th century practitioner. She was a householder and a mother, and she uh, was very much a practitioner, a deep practitioner of the heart of pra Prajna Paramita Sutras. She deeply came to understand the meaning of the sutras, and she became a practitioner herself and, and started her own, I guess, version of Chud practice, which became so famous that it was the first teaching that went actually from Tibet to India instead of from India to Tibet. And all the major lineages that we know of in the Vajrayana Tibetan tradition have their own version of her chud. And she was an extraordinary person. And the teachings that she taught were extraordinary. Um, and it has to do with working with fear, um, working with things that we usually push away. So that there's this kind of fearless quality that one develops. And um, then there's so many other great practitioners. There's Yeshe Sogil and uh, Mandarava. And they all were such formidable women. They were completely on fire to work with the mind and totally interested in experience, like the nature of experience. And um, so, you know, of course, we can read uh, their, their stories and deeply appreciate um, that. And then, you know, we often hear of female consorts. Of course, the females have male consorts. You know, it goes both ways. <laughs> and um, I actually have, uh, there are some deities and some practices where the main figure is, the, is a female de deity. Um, there's one white Tara that we practice, um, Yijin Korlo, who has a male consort 
you know, sitting on her lap. And of course, it, this is not so much about gender. It really has to do with qualities of compassion and skillful means or compassion and bliss and, uh, em I'm sorry, emptiness and skillful means or emptiness and bliss and that so forth. But um, so we see that. And then we have the yoginis who practice that we might encounter, for example, you know, my mother-in-law was a great uh, practitioner who practiced for 16 years in solitary retreat. And then she came out and had five kids, but she continued to practice. And um, she was a great example for me. And sometimes she would, uh, she'd be out doing Kora around the stupa in Nepal. And she, she'd discover a very, someone who was very special, like a female practitioner who had prostrated all the way from Lhasa to Kathmandu. And she'd invite her in for tea and then she'd invite me in and she said this is a very great dakini but nobody knew who this person was but she was obviously very powerful and very free and kind of bright and a little bit um fierce looking this was my experience of the dakinis that my mother-in-law introduced me to and my mother-in-law was also extremely fierce sometimes a little bit scary but i really uh, I learned so much from her presence. And these women, they didn't really want to teach outside. I think they didn't want the hassles of, you know, having to support a monastery like the great Tukus, you know, that we know they have so much work to do. They were kind of hidden. They kept themselves hidden. But everybody kind of knew who they were in the community and appreciated them um, so much. So th this is all um, kind of my introduction to that. And, you know, for me, what's important about all of this is the view. It's always the view in the practice. Because these are all very inspiring stories, but what are we going to do about it? <laughs> how is this, how is, what is it about this wisdom? What is this wisdom and how is this going to be helpful to us is really um, what's the most important thing, of course, for us as practitioners. And um, it's been, this Prajnaparamita for me has been kind of the center, like the core of my being since I became a Buddhist, maybe 35 years ago or whatever, whenever it was. Um, so pray, I just want to say what Prajna means. Prajna is, if, if you want to, um, is the Sanskrit, is Sanskrit. And if you want to break it down, it means um, accurate discernment, accurate discernment, like how to discern without any kind of confusion. What happens when everything extraneous to how things are fall away? All the wanting and not wanting and not really understanding the nature of what something is. What, what, where does that leave us? And I think, you know, we always think of uh, uh, prajna or, uh, uh, you know, wakefulness maybe as something kind of remote. But I think it's actually something very natural for human beings. I think people do experience prajna. And, I, and so I want to do something interactive with you that uh, will help us all uh, understand uh, what, what it means uh, uh, to have prajna and what, what is it that prajna actually sees. So when we talk about prajna, we're actually talking about the subject, our mind, like our mind, the mind that is poised for insight is prajna, insight into the nature of reality, which I, I really don't like that phrase, the nature of reality, because it sounds so highfalutin or philosophical. But what we could say is the nature of emptiness, which is even harder, I guess. But I like to say that's able to see realistically what's there. <laughs> so I don't like the nat nature of reality. I think the mind that's able to look at things realistically without impediment. So we have prajna and we have paramita, and that uh, paramita means to go beyond. The wisdom that takes us beyond our confusion, the wisdom that takes us beyond the extremes of uh, what, what the Buddha called eternalism and nihilism, which, is, which are tough philosophical words. We could say um, belief and doubt. You know, We can say hope and hopelessness. I would, there's many things we could call it, but instead of getting... I don't want to get too um, like theoretical. I think there's a different way to go about this. So that's where I want to go right now. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to interact with me. And this is the thing that I do is talk about emptiness um, in, a, uh, in an interactive way. So I'm going to need your help. But first, I want to talk about where uh, um, 
these teachings originated from. Because the Prajnaparamita teachings are, can be very abstract, very hard to understand. And yet there's a way to understand them. And the way to kind of find our way into this understanding is through the, the nature of interdependence, understanding the nature of dependent arising. And that all started when the Buddha said something very curious and profound when he had attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. And I'm sure you've heard this before, but I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, twice because it's so important um, to say. So the Buddha said, at the dawn of his awakening, he said, this being, B-E-I-N-G, this being, that becomes. From the arising of this, that arises. This not being, that becomes not. From the cessation of this, that ceases. So again, this being, that becomes. From the arising of this, that arises. This not being, that becomes not. From the cessation of this, that ceases. So, you know, I, I think most of you understand, um, in a way, what he's, what he's talking about. He la later elucidated in the teachings, for example, of the Four Noble Truths. Like, if the causes and conditions are there for something to happen, if the causes and conditions, for example, of suffering are there, suffering will arise. This being that becomes from the arising of this that arises. If the causes and conditions for suffering are not there, then suffering will cease. This not being that becomes not from the cessation of this that ceases. So based on this, this understanding of the interdependence and the causes and conditions and how they all work together, the, the Buddha, all of the Buddha's teachings are based on that. The 12 links of dependent arising, everything is based on the, this principle um, that everything leads. Okay, so in the sutras, um, when the, the Buddha was talking about dependent arising, he used a metaphor of two bundles of reeds leaning against each other like this. So the idea is this one, this bundle stands because this one, because this one stands. They both are mutually holding each other up. When the other one falls, if this falls, then this is going to fall too. So I always, the way I kind of describe this for myself, because I'm always trying to find new language for the Dharma keep the meaning, you know, so that it can become fresh and alive. You know, I feel like we all have to be translators for our Dharma it, because it's not how the Dharma is explained to us, but how do we explain this to ourselves? you know? And language is not a stuck, determinate thing. Language is, means different things at different times in different contexts. So, you know, here we are, we understand, you know, everything leans. Everything is dependent on other things to happen. We're looking at the virus and the virus is spreading because everything leads, you know? And when the causes and conditions for the virus are not there anymore, the virus will go away, you know? Or, I mean, all the beautiful things that, that we see in this world arise and they express themselves and they fall away due to causes and conditions. And so if we talk about the genesis, um, genesis or how creativity happens, the creative movement of life, in the context of the Buddha Dharma, we always have to say it arises due to the fact that things are interdependent. If everything's leaning, nothing is going to be static, you know. And this includes like even our consciousness, you know, here I'm talking to you, but where do I end and you begin? I can't really say right now. <laughs> I always ask you, try to locate, where do you stop and your world start? Could you ever really locate that place? You can't say subject and object, you know, uh, life and uh, mind and its world are playful exchange um, of, you know, ex experience is just a playful exchange of our inner and outer worlds coming together and falling away all the time. So this is a very, this has very deep implications. It's very profound. Um, and this is the, the, one of the first teachings I received from my teacher. Actually, we're sitting on a hill and he asked me, Lizzie, what is this one or two, this shape? And I said, well, it's not two things because it creates one shape, but it's not one thing because it's made, it, uh, it's made of two parts. 
And he, he was very happy when I said that, but I had no idea what he meant. It took me like so many years to figure out like, oh, he's talking about interdependence and the subtlety of this study. I became obsessed with understanding this. And this is how I came to understand the feminine principle of emptiness. So this is why I'm, I'm so, um, uh, so excited to, to share uh, this interactive exercise with you and why this is so meaningful to me. And I never get sick of it. And I'm constantly exploring it. And the world keeps pushing at me to understand it better. And a lot of the things that are happening in the world right now, I am is really pushing my understanding in a much deeper way. And maybe we could talk about that a little bit too as we go. It's like, I want to do, I want this to be practical. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm very heartbroken right now. Like I have a lot of grief, you know? Uh, um, and I, 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 um, and I look out at the world and I see on one hand, it's not fixable. But on the other hand, because everything leans, it's not fixable. On the other hand, I, I, we need to respond. We need to respond to this. And so I'm trying to sort it out all the time. Like, how can I serve? How can I help? But how can I understand too? Uh, I heard somebody use the phrase, you know, you can't meditate yourself out of this crisis. And I thought, well, meditation, I understand that. But meditation is not about fixing the world. Meditation is about getting your, uh, being able to hold the fact that there's so much suffering and there's so much grief and there's so much um, beauty also. And can you bear it, you know? At the same time, uh, it's through understanding and not being reactive that we can actually respond in a very healthy and sane way. And I think that's what this is about, what I'm about to uh, present to you because in fact we need to sort this out like what do we have agency to change and what don't we have agency to change because i think when we we feel like we should be fixing the world it's not a realistic way of looking at the world and yet are we powerful in our ability to influence i think because everything is leaning we're very powerful so I think that the, the, the teachings on bodhicitta and the feminine principle really help us understand um, how this works. So um, there is a great uh, teacher called Nagarjuna, and he taught a lot about the nature of dependent arising. He's one of my great heroes. I, won't, I can't say too much about him right now, only that he made the teachings on interdependence very um, explicit. And then after him, many, many teachers came along and wrote commentaries about what he had to say about interdependence. He, did, he wasn't an innovator, but he was revitalizing or bringing the teachings out in a way that people could understand from the Prajnaparamita Sutras and from the quote that we just went over. So um, I teach this, as some of you know very well, because there's a couple of people in here who've done this with me a lot. So I want to make sure you can see these sticks that I have three. Can you see that I have these three different um, lengths of sticks? Yeah. So what I want to do is I hope that you will interact with me because I have a lot of questions. Maybe at first you could just raise your hand when I ask a question, but then we're going to have to start to talk about this. So um so I have these three sticks, and I'm going to take this one stick. Okay, I just want you to see the size of this. Can you see okay? Okay, so we're going to, we're going to start with this one stick. And I want to ask you some questions about length. So the first question I want to ask you is, um, how would you measure up this stick? W would you say that it's a long stick or a short stick? Or what could you say about the length of this stick? First, maybe it'll be easier if I ask you, how many people find this, we consider this to be a long stick? Nobody? No long sticks? Okay, who would consider this to be a short stick? Okay, two, few people now. More people think it's short. You sure nobody for a long stick? If anybody wants to unmute, they can say anything they want about it <laughs> well it seems relative but yeah I mean, it's relative. It's... yeah i get it okay anybody else my four-year-old would think it's long 
I don't think it's that long, but I could imagine it being considered long. Yeah, like a shorter person for a shorter person, smaller person, it could be longer. Yeah. So again, you're saying it's relative. It all depends, right? On who's who's perceiving the stick. Okay, that's really great. So just to to kind of push that along further, then if I put this stick above it, then this this original stick, what we what information then does that give you or what could you say about it now? Seems longer. Yeah, it's longer than this one. Like as Matt says, it's it's all relative, right? It depends what you put next to it, right? Okay, so now what? Now what happens to this stick? Shorter. It becomes shorter in relationship to this longer stick, right? So it seems the, the little marking holes are one on the shorter stick and more on the next oh, yeah. That's and true. One on the long stick. Well, you know, John, if we wanted to, we could compare, you know, which one has the most markings. But I just for the simplicity's sake, I just went for length. Um, you right. could do it with any kind of characteristic. So what we're looking for here is we're talking about characteristics. So I just decided to go with length because that's what Chanda Kirti did. So I'm just kind of following his lead. And I think it, it's easier. It's harder to see the markings. So, um, so then I, I want to ask you, would you say that the length is in the stick? No, wait, the, I'm, you hold the middle stick. Would you say that the length is in the stick itself? Yes. No. Anila said no. Who said yes? John. Okay, well, so what would you say? How could you say the length is in the stick? If it's, yeah. Tell us more. Because I can discern that there's one end and I can discern there's another end. Right. But in terms of long and short, does it have its own intrinsic length? No, that's relative. Yeah. Shannon, did you want to say? I think the length is relative to the vessel that it's in. Ah, uh -huh. so you think the length is in here? No, outside of there. Oh, outside. Oh, I see. So you're saying in relationship. Yeah. So like, it, it reminds me of the glass, how, how full it is. If it's full of stones, then you can say it's full. But then if you add sand, then it's even more full. So the length is relative to like the container that it's in. Oh, I see. The container. Okay. Maybe the content so in your house, it's short, but maybe. In oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So that's another way to look at it. That's very much what John was saying. Like if a young child holds it, it's longer. Uh, and, and, but if somebody bigger holds it, you know, it can seem much shorter. So exactly. So we're all talking about how things are relative and we could measure it. We could say like in inches, it could be, you know, a foot long, but that's, is, is it inches in this, in the stick itself, or is it inches the way kind of a contrived way that we decide to measure something based on wanting to participate in life together. It's the contrived. It's contrived. So again, the inches are not in the stick, right? I agree. Okay. John agrees. That's good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so then I want to ask you something because, you know, measurement, does this make measurement less effective that it's not in the stick? Depends on your intention. Mm. But I guess what I'm asking is, you know, if something doesn't have its own intris intrinsic truth to it, like its own intrinsic length, does that mean that it's not functional anymore? Like, can we tell long and short, even though it's not in the stick? That we can still determine whether something's shorter and something's longer, right? But are you suggesting that that there is no such thing as length until it's created by the interaction of all the things it's compared to in any given moment. That's right. Who said that? Pardon me? No, no. It's me, Flo. I'm, I'm in the dark here. Oh, Flo. Okay, Flo. Yes, I think that's what I'm saying. Or that, I think that's what you're saying. This is the beauty of this is I'm not saying this. I'm trying to get you to say it. Because if I say it, big deal. But if you say it based on your own direct experience, this is what this is what I'm getting at. So, so you know, things find 
what it what this exercise is trying to help us understand is things find characteristics based upon other relationship their relationship to other things but just because they only have characteristics based on other things doesn't mean that the fact that it doesn't reduce the power of relationship and size so example so for example you know the fact that um you know we use measurement for so many things like if we get into the car to drive we have to fill up the tank with a certain amount of gas money is a measurement of value um time is a measurement of continuum you know of, of our experience the infrastructure that we drive our cars on it's all measured you know the fact that we can get on this call at the same time and um you know all of everything's measured the computer was measured uh, to make you know when it was assembled everything is measured we we don't even appreciate how much we use measurement in our life but again measurement is not an intrinsic thing it exists only in relationship to other things does that do you see what i'm saying i'm going to we're going to go deeper i just I mean, you're the ones who said that it, it, that things find characteristics of length in relationship to other things. Is there anyone who wants to question John? Are you trying? I love the Sadhana Mahamudra. Mm -hmm. what, one Me of the famous lines there is it's the echo of emptiness yet real. Is Yeah, maybe. I, well, yeah, this is in the realm of that. So, I question whether okay. this Let, let's, okay. Let's let's talk about that for a second. Real means that it has this relative power of appearance, that it's functional, that it's not just a void or a blank. And yet when you look for anything intrinsic existing in the object itself that's true and always so, you will not find anything. You know, I think sometimes like we will take something like this stick. And we will hold something up and we will still insist that this is intrinsically, intrinsically small. Do you know what I mean? Like we look out at the world and we think, and we decide that we know what something is. There's not that kind of openness and wonder to, to see that things are relative and they have different meanings in different contexts and that they change and that there's this whole magical open um, aspect to our life that def uh, resists definition that resists um, our ability to, to kind of grab it and label it and know it in an intrinsic way. And yet it's very functional and we can play with it and it works. Okay, let, let's me, let me move to the next aspect of the exercise, but I think what you're saying, yes, this is what we're talking about. You know, the world of appearances and possibilities can happen because everything is leaning and moving and expressing itself and that's what I mean by the genesis of appearance is that the apparent world arises due to causes and conditions. It is expressing itself and it dissipates due to causes and conditions. And the reason it can actually move is because there's nothing intrinsic about it. If this stick was always so, then it doesn't matter what was next to it. It would always be so because it would be true from its own size that it was long or short. Are you following? I mean, this is kind of, in a way, it's very simple, but it, it takes a, you have to, it takes a while to kind of see what I'm getting at. But this is so key to the view of the feminine principle. So we have to keep going. So let me ask you some, another thing about the stick. What is the function of the stick or the purpose, the function or the, uh, yeah, just say, let's say the function. What could you use it for? Oops, don't forget to unmute. Unmute, because I can't hear anybody, but I... A walking stick. A walking stick for someone who's kind of short, like a four-year-old. <laughs> to make a flute. What's that? Make a flute. You can make, maybe you can hollow it out and make a flute out of it. Never heard that one. That's a good word. You can use it for firewood. Firewood, yeah. For teaching. For teaching. That's right. That's what I use sticks for. 
Show interdependence. Show interdependence. That's <laughs> absolutely it. So, so, you know, you can even think of a different species, like a bug could uh, want to burrow into it to live inside, you know, or a bird can perch on it. Like different, different species see this in, the, in different ways. And I, once I saw this one movie where um, it, this one young boy in Tibet had never seen a tree. And it shows him at the end of the movie seeing a tree for the first time. Like some people might not even know what this is. You know, it's, it all depends. And so this is actually a phrase that helps. It all depends. This doesn't have its own function from its own side. It all depends on the context, on who comes upon it, um, on what somebody uses it for. So every this, you know, I'm using sticks and talking about length and, and sticks and all this. It's not about sticks. It's about having some curiosity, openness, and wonder about the world we encounter because we can never really know it in a static, solid, one-dimensional way. So there's this one, uh, a translator, Herbert Gunther, I, you've probably heard of him. He talked about emptiness as open dimensionality. So basically this stick is open dimensional because it all depends on how you use it. It's infinitely dimensional, like everything else. You know, people are open dimensional. Everything is open dimensional. Nothing is stuck in its place. So you could like look at your own identity in that way. For example, like if you're a parent, you know, if you have children, you're a parent. But in relationship to your parents, you're a child. In relationship to your brother, you're a sister or a brother. You know, when you go to the market, you're a, you're a customer. Or when you go to the dentist, you're a patient. You're not one thing. It all depends on the context, you know, how you function. This is what I'm trying to say. It's not one thing. It's not stuck in its place. You know, it, it all depends on what's next to it. It all depends what it's used for. That's the purpose of this exercise. And it's very interesting. So I just want to make sure you understand, because now we've, we've, you've brought up, John, this idea that, say that quote again, that. The echo of emptiness is real. That's, that's a description of make your door jam. Yeah. So if, if something is, because everything is leaning, it all depends then the world is moving and changing and dynamic. It's like the natural cre creativity of the nature is what we're talking about. Okay. So it's because it's leaning, it's empty. We can't say what it is. Emptiness is that it's empty of true characteristics from its own side. That's what emptiness means. People often think of emptiness as a void, but in fact, Emb emptiness is more like it's open dimensional. It's full of possibility. It can be worked with, you know, it, we can actually uh, navigate and play with it. It's, it's a highly functional phenomenon, interdependence. We live in, and move about in the world of emptiness and interdependence all the time. And so the fact thing, because things are leaning, because they're interdependent, because it all depends, things are empty. And it's because things are empty that anything can move. Again, if this was stuck in a long, st a short state, you would always be short, even independent, even in relationship to this. So, you know, we we have so well, we, the way we look at the world is not necessarily a, with wonder and awe, you know. And I think when we think of wonder, awe, and curiosity. Sometimes we feel like this term openness is kind of um, a dysfunctional, a dysfunctional way of being because it, it disables our ability to make choices. We're just open. We can't make a choice. But in fact, if you look at your own experience, what would you say? Is your mind more functional when you have an open mind or is your mind more functional when you're kind of shut down around your own ideas? What do you think? Really, from your own experience. Can I ask you a question, please? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Please. Um, 
you know, we're talking about the stick and sort of the relative uses of the stick. And so you can't put one particular label on that stick and say that, like, this is only a drumstick or something, right? But I, but you can't, can you say, it, it doesn't seem to me that you can say that the stick is limitless in its functionality, right? Like the stick isn't water, like you can't drink the stick. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a good point. It has it has limits in the sense of if the causes and conditions are there for something to happen, it will happen. If the causes and conditions are not there for something to happen, it can't happen. So within the nature, that's good. Thank you, Ornella, for bringing that up. Within the nature of causes and conditions, of course, there are limits. Like for example, if I want to jump off the roof and fly, I can't fly because I don't have wings. I don't have the causes <laughs> and conditions, and yet. We have airplanes and helicopters and hang gliders and like we can still innovate. So it's interesting how this all works. If you plant an apple seed, you'll always get an apple tree, you know, and this is what's so incredible about the nature itself because we can navigate it because there's some kind of natural order to the way that things arise, you know, and it's because like we've been able to see that seed gives rise to, to, sprout that gives rise to tree that gives rise to fruit that we can support ourselves through agriculture like we can read patterns so how is the nature and it's again like what john was saying like it's so highly functional and beautiful and intricate and we're always navigating it and we're always reading pat but we we have trouble too because what happens is that sometimes like we want happiness but we're not looking carefully at the causes and conditions for happiness with the causes and conditions for suffering. So we get back to that quote too, that the Buddha is suggesting that we need to really look at our actions. So this gets us to the next point is that if everything is leaning, if everything is interdependent, does it matter what we do? <laughs> yeah. Why does it matter so much? John? <laughs> I could monopolize the entire discussion. <laughs> you start. Maybe someone else will continue on. Well, it's. Could you quick ask the question again so I can remember the words? Well, if, if so, you, does everybody, do you think that everything leads? Do you see the nature of interdependent relationships? Yes. So we've, we've been talking about it. We've been talking about things have their own meaning or purpose or function in a context. And so it's, it's, we're looking at the nature of interdependence or we're looking at how identity. I remember, it does matter what you do with the sticks, because if you do negative things, the curiosity, openness, awe, and joy and whatever other kind of awe, other kind of nice words that we all seek, if you use those sticks negatively, that characteristic of the play becomes dead. Yeah. So, so we're not really just talking about sticks. The stick is just an example, but when we look at the world around us, we are part of this intricate system of interconnected relationship. I mean, we all see this. We see like the virus is a perfect example of that. Like a virus can spread. If it, it's so small, if we don't wear a mask, if we don't wash our hands, if we don't you know, because we're in contact, we see how easily we get our feelings hurt. We see how easily we can hurt others. This, this goes to show us that we also have incredible power, you know, as citizens of this great nature of interdependent relationships. You know, I always say like, you know, we're a member of a family, we're, we're a citizen of a town, or, or we're the citizen of the world. But our greatest citizenship is that we're part of the nature of interdependent relationships, you know, and that's a power in a way that makes us very, very small. Because if you look at the entire universe, we're just like a speck in the universe. So we can't get really bloated about who we are. At the same time, we're part of this incredible intricate system where everything we do matters. This is just trying to show us who we are in relationship to the world around us. Hmm. The other interesting part, and one of the reasons I want to bring, I want to, I love to bring this up, and this is very important right now, I think to me, in terms of being practical, is that we look out at the world and there's this kind of pain of wanting to fix it. 
there's this pain of s- seeing how difficult things are and kind of not understanding where our sense of agency is in relationship to that. Or I don't know, maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but I, the, the, I, the, you know, right now it's very, to talk about Dharma in an abstract way without looking at what's happening. There's something, I mean, that's not the, the practice of bodhicitta and that's not the practice of our lineage to just think about, you know, oh, this is very interesting or just to think about ourselves, but that we're part of this the human predicament. We're part of what we call samsara, which is a completely unfixable situation. And I find as a teacher and as a person myself, this is the hardest part of all of this is that it's like we have just forget what's happening in the world right now, which could be for a moment, which can be so overwhelming, but just even in a family situation or a community situation, we find ourselves in such a difficult situations and we wish we could change it and we feel it's unfair and we can't kind of accept that actually things are the way that they are, you know? And I always say, and this is what hits home for most people, and it really helps me to say this, is that is ask people if they've ever tried to change another person. <laughs> because if you've ever tried to change another person and you see how impossible that is, you know, try to fix the world then. You know? <laughs> and when I say like the world is not a fixable place, it's not because it's broken, but because everything is leaning. So when we talk about the fact that everything's interdependent, it has a very strong thing to teach us about the reality in which we live. And there's two realities. There's a relative reality, and then there's like the, 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 what we call the absolute reality or the reality of the nature of things. So the relative reality is because everything's leaning, everything we do matters. So we need to try with all our might to, to serve, to contribute, you know, to be kind, you know, uh, this is that one aspect of the reality. The other aspect of the reality is that we'll never be able to fix it because it's not one thing, you know? If we talk, if I say like, try to imagine the world, what comes into your mind? What image? Let's hear what you have to say. Now, John, you have to not say for a minute. Let's see if we can get other people. <laughs> You could come afterwards. The planet. Sorry? The planet. The planet, a, a, like an image of the planet. Mm-hmm. An image of the protesters. Yeah, that's what happened to me too. I saw the, the streets are filled with protesters. What else could you say? Mine was in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. We're really lost the dreams. Whoops. Again? Sorry. I just get completely overwhelmed at at the thought of even defining it because so many things come to mind. Exactly. Exactly. Mary Beth, did you want to say? I just see rivers and streams, a lot of water. Nature. Bodies of nature, bodies of water, things like that. Right. So, So, exactly. So, the world that what we call the world is not as some singular thing. It's, it resists definition. It's way too dynamic for, you know, to, to fix. It's not something that can change from here to there. That's what I mean by not fixable. It, so to, to see that the world is it's full of beauty, it's full of pain, it's beauty, it can be anything that you imagine it to be or encounter it to be. Every inch of earth is different. It's all just this, you know, ungraspable, open dimensional phenomena. In other words, it's empty. It's not a singular thing. It's not a permanent thing. And it's not something that exists outside the nature of interdependent relationships. You know, it doesn't exist out of, outside of causes and conditions. Therefore, it's not a thing to be fixed or to be changed. And what I find that this is so, in, this is, I mean, this is a feminine principle, the meaning of emptiness. This is a description 
of what the objective world, when I say objective, I mean, it includes our thoughts, whatever can be understood by our awareness. So our thoughts are like the activity of our mind, the world we encounter, our idea of who we are. It's all of this nature. So if the world can't be completely grasped, you know, what we're trying to do is see things accurately, right? So this is a description of an accurate way to understand the nature of the phenomena. Do you see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So what kind of mind could grasp such a, such an extraordinary kind of experience? Elizabeth, I, 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 you asked a lot of questions and I've been, um, trying to imagine that um, I think everything we do has an, it has an impact since we're leaning. So everyone we come into contact with is somehow impacted. And I have been trying really hard to figure out a way to, um, to have a clear enough mind to ask people what they see going on right now and just being able to hear it without judgment. And I live between cultures, sort of an academic uh, Northeast Mid-Atlantic culture and a Southern um, working class culture where, my, where um, I used to live. And so I'm really, um, I feel like a burden that I have such an impact because I feel like if, my, if I can't clear my mind enough by the time I open my mouth and ask, I could cause harm by not opening my mouth also is causing harm because um because we're not in conversation so i'm really feeling um what you're speaking about yeah thank you ellen i think actually that's so inspiring what you're saying about asking a question because i think you just responded very accurately to the question i just asked and what kind of mind would be able to bear witness to the fact that it can't know anything in a determinate way I would say the mind of an open question, the mind of curiosity, you know, the mind, a mind that has the qualities of humbleness and interest, which is also discerning. You're listening and you're discerning and you're in a state of learning. So Cheyenne, am I, am I saying you're, am I saying Shan, Shannon, 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 sorry. Well, I'm curious. I don't mean to be argumentative and maybe oh. Well, will be that. How can you have accurate discernment then? See, now this is a, I'm so glad that this question came up because we often think when the mind is open, it's not discerning. So let me ask you, is your mind more discerning when it's open or when it's kind of shut down and already knows? Really look at your own experience. So what you're saying is that accurate discernment is the openness of all possibility? Well, I think an open mind is able to discern more clearly than a mind that's not open. I'm just suggesting that you think about that. I guess I'm relating it to like the stick and all of the other things that they don't have their own intrinsic value. So how can you discern what they are accurate? Well, that's what I, this is what I'm trying to get at. So I'm glad you're just, <laughs> it should be poking at this. So that's why I'm saying it doesn't have its own intrinsic plate. And yet in re the, the relationship is highly functional. So is that's my accurate discernment different than your accurate discernment? Correct. Well, yeah, I mean, in, in a way, yeah, we're all discerning things differently. Like Ellen was saying, everybody's people, she's getting different points of view. We all said we see the world in a different way, but we also have collective agreements. We all know things are going on. We know that seed leads to sprout, leads to, you know, we're reading patterns together. But the interesting thing is, you know, we don't agree on it. It's amazing how much we don't see the world the same. That's why there's so much conflict in the world. And that's why there's so much creativity in the world. And yet here we are participating together at the same time. I just find that so fascinating. 
you know, we're functioning very well together. You know, we are kind of some basic human things that we can really talk about. We have a shared language. We have a shared sense of measurement. But we still argue about words. We still <laughs> like, have different ideas, you know, about measurement. <laughs> you know? So th this is what I'm trying to say. We have a tendency to think, okay, it's either open or not true. Or it's true. And we have to, in order to make a decision, we have to have a fixed mind. But what this is showing is, actually, that's a very limited system. So when the Buddha said that, uh, the Buddha said, talked about the middle way, free of extremes, right? The extremes are thinking something exists in an, one way. It either exists or it doesn't exist. Eternalism or nihilism. If something exists, then it has to have a truth. If it has a truth, you have to believe it, right? If you want to be right. On the other hand, if something doesn't exist or it's not real or you don't believe it, then, you know, it isn't. So the Buddha said this. And this is very important because we need to get to this place. The Buddha said that things exist is one extreme, that they don't is another extreme. He says, but I, the Tathagata, accept neither is or is not. And I accept the truth from the middle position. So when we say middle position, we're getting to the pra Prajnaparamita, actually. Because like in the Heart Sutra, I'm sure you're all familiar, it says gone, gone, gone beyond. So what are we going beyond there? The extremes. extremes, right, Sue? Sue, you said that? Um, yeah, the extremes of existence. Our beliefs. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so who said that next? Padma or? I said our beliefs. Who's I? Let's see. Oh, yeah, Padma. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So when we talk about things having to be is or is not, true or untrue, we, we talk about in the, in the context of the Dharma, we talk about those as being beliefs or views. The Nagarjuna said about the Buddha, I prostrate to he who has abandoned all views. So we say gone, gone, gone beyond, gone completely beyond, that's Prajnaparamita. That's the feminine principle. The ability, this is what I was saying in the beginning, how I tried to define it, is the ability to bear that things are not one way. That there's not something that can be fixed from one thing to another, make, change it from one thing, because it never was one thing in the first place, to another thing. And yet, the way we navigate the world, how we navigate it, how we respond to it is of the utmost importance, because cause and effect are very powerful. Very powerful. So I think what I'm trying to get at is that I see a lot of suffering in myself, in, in the world around me, in shutting down around views. Like, I see what happens in the culture, you know, especially what we're seeing now. Where is this going to go? You know, and how are we going to work with it? And, and how are we not going to, how can we keep a sense of openness and wonder? Because also not one thing is going to happen. You know, it's going to constantly be dynamic. Things that we think might not be positive could become positive in some areas. Things that we think are, kind of, are negative might have a different impact than we expect. And it's always like this all the time. So how can we rest with that kind of equanimity without shutting down around, um, without without shutting down around the world that we're moving about it? How can we keep our mind from grasping and rejecting? How can we keep our mind like an open question that is humble and full? You know what, in the Vajrayana teachings, the main instruction is not to grasp at things, not, not to, to grasp at ideas and not to reject them. You know, when we're sitting in our meditation practice and things are arising, how do we, how do we poise our mind in meditation? And I think like what you were saying, Ellen, this idea of asking an open question, you know, of um, 
not shutting down the mind. You know, that's considered the prajna. Prajna has two aspects. The prajna of being able to bear that things, uh, the, the things are one way. That things have some intrinsic truth. Like when you sit in meditation and something arises, what do we usually do? We either want it or we don't want it. It's so hard. Like the term in uh, Tibetan, zirpa, it means patience. The highest form of patience is the ability to bear, what they say, bear emptiness, to not shut down, to keep the mind open, curious, and humble. You know, this is where, this is a place of refuge, like protection, you know, from belief and doubt, from is and is not. It's a place of incredible wisdom and equanimity. This is wisdom. This is the wisdom ring. This is the prajna. The other aspect of prajna is to be able to read patterns, um, understanding cause and effect, and how to move about the world in a way that brings benefit. So reading patterns is one kind of prajna, and the ability to bear witness without shutting down is the other aspect of prajna. The prajna, again, is the feminine principle. These are the two aspects of the feminine principle. Um, in, in uh, Mahayana Buddhism, but it's also true in the Vajrayana because the wisdom is the wisdom. Wisdom is the feminine principle. Wisdom and luminosity is the other way of talking about in the, in the Mahayana, we talk about wisdom. We talk about emptiness and appearance. In the Vajrayana, we talk about emptiness and luminosity, but the principle is the same. There's no Vajrayana without the Mahayana view. Do you feel confused? A little bit. Ani, like, why do I do you feel confused about it? Um, because I don't understand how we can act then. If we have this if we have this kind of view that there really sort of isn't a view, and that um and I'm talking about act in a moral way, not like towards our concrete um possessions, you know. But like, if I'm saying, for example, in the current situation with the um, protests, I, can, I don't really feel comfortable saying, uh, oh, like everyone has the potential to be correct because it's clearly that some people are not correct in this situation. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so let's, okay, so let's take that. That's a very happy you brought this up because we really have to grapple with this a little bit. Because it's always this kind of tipping toward eternalism and nihilism. And this is a very significant question. So I would say that, that whether something is bad or good, we have a very important context for that. So in the Dharma, we say things are so-called bad or good by virtue of whether they create benefit or harm. And how do we, what context do we have for benefit or harm? Is, is this is what we say in the Dharma. There's a very precise context. And I think for the most part, human beings naturally understand this. And that is that we all long for happiness and want freedom from suffering. It's like when we have a plant and we put it toward the window, it always goes toward the light. And we don't always know the causes and conditions for happiness and suffering. This is our problem. But the noble intention to be happy is there in everyone. So based upon this context, we can identify, because this is our context too. This is the human context. It's the, it's the living being context, context, not just humans. This longing for happiness, this desire to survive, you know, this uh, wanting not to suffer is the context for our activity, you know, for our, for our ethical conduct. Where our understanding of others. So that's why I'm saying this is very powerful. Like the fact that things are open and don't have intrinsic qualities doesn't mean that in the, their context, they are not incredibly powerful. And so this is, this is why I think is a Dharma teacher too, it is in, in listening to other Dharma teachers and hearing how people discuss this, there's often a split between this idea of transcendence, which means resting in emptiness, and then this whole um, uh, need to respond to the world in which we live. And I think sometimes when we just 
emphasize emptiness too much, we undermine other people's struggles. It, it, that's, but that's not really what the Dharma is saying. The, the Dharma, the bodhicitta, is the perfect expression of the nature of uh, working within the, the context of relationship and understanding emptiness. So if we have too much this idea of we separate emptiness and appearance, emptiness and interdependence, we have a problem because it's like undermining the world of suffering, undermining other people's troubles, you know, undermining something that it's like a negation of the power of cause and effect and our responsibility in the world. But if we just focus on relationship and we are out there trying to fix the world, that is also um, a misunderstanding. I think like there's three ways we try to, we relate to the suffering in the world. One is that we try to fix it. And when we see we can't fix it, we fall into despair or we can tune out. And I think when we talk about bodhicitta or the bodhisattva path, like I, Sue knows this very well, that sometimes I describe the bodhisattva path as, you know, the, the task is to burn with love in a world we can't fix. And we can't fix it because it's not one singular, permanent, independent thing. But we can influence, we can interrupt, we can, you know, we can change things. Like it's powerful. But what I mean when I say fix is we can't take, the world is not one thing we can fix into another thing. Okay. This is, it's, this is hard for people. I understand this. I, I spend my life trying to, you know, as you do, I'm sure, wanting to respond to my world. And I actually think, like, we're looking at this sense of agency. Do we have agency to fix the world? Especially since the world is, we can't even determine what the world is. But we do have agency every day, all the time to respond. And we have to sort this out. But I think this idea that, that the world has to be fixed is a difficult thing for us. It's overwhelming. And it creates a lot of despair because somehow we can't seem to do it. Do you, do you see what I'm saying, Anila? Yeah, I see what you're saying, but... I, I'm thinking of the Bodhisattva vow, and it's in the Bodhisattva's whole purpose to kind of fix <laughs> things. Yeah. No. So I, don't think so, I don't think so. I think, you know, the, the vow, this is very important. I think the vow is saying, like, beings are limitless, and so their suffering is limitless. So mm -hmm. I have to be limitless, too, mm -hmm. to accommodate the suffering of this world. Because Let's look at the Buddhist teachings. Samsara is not a fixable place. That's why we take refuge. What are we taking refuge in? Not our ability to fix, but our ability to, to bear witness and to respond. Like if you think of the, the Chenrezig, the Bodhisattva Chenrezig, the Bodhisattva compassion, it means, Chenrezig literally means one who doesn't ever shut their eyes to the sufferings of the world, which mm -hmm. means bearing witness to bear witness to the samsara to bear witness like you know they the analogy for compassion is often a mother with no arms watching their child you know float down or drown in a river it's a it's a it's a deep and poignant thing you know and and, and there's no evolution in samsara there's no evolution there's there's old age sickness and death <laughs> That's not evolution in a certain way. So what does it mean for us to evolve? You know, really, then in the context of what we're talking about. I love this exchange. It is so helping me to think about conversations with my uh, family. That, um, so, of course, I'm scared to ask because I know what I might hear. I'm pretty sure what I, things I might hear. And then how do you not, like, on a, like, they're just wrong. You know, you want to say, and but, like, okay, so I can't go there. I can't judge them because as soon as I judge, now I've 
closed off, right? Then it went, my bodhisattva valve of the window. So, uh, so then <laughs> what do I, so rather what if I could see clearly no one in my family just wants people to suffer. So they must be in their own pain. So then how do I relieve the suffering of the person in front of me that is saying these things instead of thinking about how I'm going to relieve the suffering of someone in Minneapolis, right? But, it's a hard uh, thing. Yeah, and I Lord, but you, you're pushing my thinking, one, getting me one step closer to being able to have some conversation. Thank yeah, it's very, it's like a, it's a predicament. I always say like, it's a, it's a predicament, but when you're, when you're able to practice and your heart is like, um, your mind is very open and you're discerning and you're curious and there's like creativity and compassion, you find ways to, to help. You find ways to serve everywhere, everywhere. You start to see it everywhere. Like it, it just, your, your heart drives you, your clarity drives you when you're not shutting down. But if you're trying to fix the world, you'll just continue to fall into despair because suffering is endless. Sentient beings are endless. That's what it says. And so, you know, I find this is such a fascinating dilemma. It's like, a, I, I say it's that living in the heart of the human predicament, because how else are you going to live your life? Like, where is our agency? If somebody had agency to really fix the world, then someone like the Buddha would have fixed it. Elizabeth? Yeah. I just, I just kind of, oh, I have a question and maybe just kind of a thought is that when you, when you keep, when I hear you say fix, what comes to my mind is, it's more about me, you know? Like uh, fixing sounds more about like the self, more about me and in about all this activity. And then, and then when I hear you saying about like the, but the, what we do have agency for and, and, um, and, and openness and sounds, it seems like that's more of a human connection, you yeah. know, that's like great. great, great and so it, it seems to me like that's, that's doable. That's openness. That's that, um, I just remember Pema Chodron saying one time that when I heard her about like being, you find the humanness in the other person mm. and, and, and that's how you can have a conversation. I just keep trying to remember that because I so often just want to make things very solid and, and very, and then I get nowhere. Yeah, of course that's, we all do that and we all get nowhere with that. And that's, it's the interesting thing. Like how do we burn with love and not, and, and be able to just kind of stay open it's so, I always say it's hard to bear pain and it's hard to bear beauty too. Mm -hmm. We have trouble bearing witness to beauty. When we see something beautiful, we want to just whip out our camera and photo. Yeah, it's like we get agitated by the beauty. And so this is pointing to the prajna. This is pointing to that mind that's open, yet it's discerning, you know? Sometimes in, in my book, I talked about like a radio interview, like with Terry Gross or something, you know, I like fresh air. <laughs> You know, you hear the topic, but it's like this singular idea. And then this discussion opens and you learn about this person's, um, you know, their life, the human condition with the jobs that they do. We hear stories and it just keeps opening and opening and opening. You know, it's never one thing, but, but discernment and specificity and wisdom and learning can happen in questioning, in openness, you know. If there's no openness, actually nothing is going to happen. You just shut down and become a fundamentalist. You know, what we're, in a way, what, what we're talking about is not being a fundamentalist. You know, when we shut down about whether something's good or whether something's bad or that it's real or it's not real, like, what does that even mean? But what happens if we leave our mind open and we stop the habitual tendencies we have to push away and and grasp all the time. And so I, I often use as a metaphor the mind of an open question because, well, first, I love that when my mind is the mind of an open question, I enjoy my mind so much. And what I love about other people is when they're curious and interested and discerning and open. And I think that's a very highly functional state. I think when we think that open and openness and discernment are at odds, that's an artificial separation. I think it's from openness and interest and curiosity and humility 
that our most, our intelligence and creativity arise. I guess all I'm suggesting is you check this for yourself. You don't have to listen to me. <laughs> There's nothing like the confidence that comes from seeing this for yourself. Like I've seen this in myself. I know when my mind is at its best and I know when my mind is at its worst. And my mind is at its best when it's open and curious. And, it, it, and that protects me. It makes me more loving and interested and respectful of people. Well, I see someone and, and I think, you know, I get an impression and it, it gets really stuck, but I know in my heart of hearts that nothing is stuck. Let me give you an example, okay, of something that also will help. What they say in the tradition of the uh, Mahayana, this is really true, like in the way of the Bodhisattva, the whole text is really about this, especially the ninth chapter. They say that all the negative emotions arise from grasping to something they say is real, but it's like holding on to an idea about something. So let me, we sometimes call this reification. It means we're making it real. It's the opposite of seeing the nuance in the interdependent relationship of who someone is, which is like not as, no one is static. No one is permanent. Nothing is singular or whole. We're all beyond the ability we're all beyond this kind of concrete concretizing. We're so we're part of the great nature of interdependent relationships. So here's the two really good examples that I always use. So, but they work. So when we train the military to go to war and fight, we try to train the military to objectify or reify the enemy. We try to train the the men and women who go to war to see the others on the other side of the, you know, in the war zone on the other side as the enemy. But when we look at people in the eyes and we see there's someone's son or brother or father, we think of them as a human being. We start to see the open dimensional, open dimensionality of them. It's very difficult to be aggressive. It's very difficult to be aggressive. And the military knows this. You know, another, another example is like, um, you know, in advertising, people who are involved, who do advertising understand that when you get somebody to reify an object, like it's perfect, they want so much, uh, uh, um, kind of coveting and grasping arises within our being. So therefore, when they're showing you the car or the, whatever they want you to buy, they make it look perfect. They don't talk about like the other side of all compounded things that it breaks down and it the, you know, whatever the problems that come with owning anything, they'll never talk about that. They just present a, a perfect image of something so that you want it more. That's how it works. Like grasping or rejection, it all comes from reification. Not seeing that, that the truth does not exist in the object. Nothing is all good. Nothing is all bad. You know, and so how do we open up the mind's tendency to shut down is we start to tease out and look at the interdependent relationships of things. Elizabeth, this yeah. oh, this is Alyssa. Hi, I, Alyssa. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm a little um, dark here in Albany, New York, but um, I I wonder if you might describe the experience of discernment, because I think that might be tripping us up a bit. Like what, so yeah. does discernment exist in and of itself or is it, is it in relationship to it's uh, the causes and conditions? So, because I think sometimes we think discernment is solid, you know, th that it's intelligence or it's uh you know, a feeling or, uh, you know, you get your, it's your gut. It's, uh, it can be, it can be but it, that's not solid because your gut is always changing depending on the circumstances. <laughs> that's interdependent. You know, your, it could be your gut instinct. It could be your conscience. It can become totally from the heart. You know, I think right now what's happening in, in our world, in our country, that's discernment to know well, that something very, very wrong happened. That's our discernment. 
I mean, can, discernment can be very simple, like distinguishing an apple from an orange. It can be very simple. But it, it's also, I mean, based on our understanding of, you know, longing for happiness and freedom from suffering, that's the context from which we know how we should treat others, you know, how should we should be in the world. What's, what's right or wrong ethically, you know, how, how to bring our actions. Also, like when we're faced with all this confusion and turmoil, it's like we're trying to use our discernment to see what can I change and what can't I change? Where is my agency and how can I serve, you know? And I, I mean, I, when this whole thing happens, we too, like everybody, I'm just trying to think, what the hell can I do? And at first it, it took me a while to get my bearings. You know, I live in the country. I can't go out and, and stand in the street, which I probably would if I was in New York city, but, but I'm in the country, you know, so I had to start thinking and I started looking at websites and I started, you know, and, and also in the teachings, I'm trying to discuss it and talk to people about it. I mean, that's why I, we can't just sit here and talk about the feminine principle without looking at the world in which we live and, and how we can be loving and respond and take responsibility and, and kind of even also look at our own position, you know, of privilege and our own position of, um, you know, just what are our resources and what can we do? You know, we all should be doing that right now. Um, so there's a lot of sorting out to do, and yet there's this whole thing about fixing the world. And if you don't have this bigger view, this kind of openness and uh, 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 this ability to bear witness, I just think bear witness is the best word I can hear. Because I think there's two things we can do when we see suffering. We, can, we have to bear witness. I mean, we've had to bear witness to what's going on and let it touch us and let it change us. And it's poignant and it's not easy, you know? It's not easy with pain, and like we we're saying, it's not easy with beauty either. And then we also have to respond. You know, but yeah. But I also think um, it's that we might not have all the information yet. Like it might not, it might not have revealed itself. And that's that's the the patience that I've been trying to cultivate uh, in myself to to see if there's more information before I, you know charge in and and say oh yeah this is the right thing yeah i understand that Alyssa. you know i think that that we is it ever possible to get all the information like everybody's having a different experience and a different view everybody's throwing out different statistics that's why it's confusing you know no one ever gets all the information we only ever always only see a very little piece of things right yes and that's where the humility comes in that's where some kind of sense of, of humility and, um, I mean, that's the hard part too, you know? right. but it's also, it's also the truth of the, the re looking at things realistically is life resists our understanding of it. Mm -hmm. We'll never even know what are all the causes and conditions that led up to such difficult things. And, and yet we have to respond and we know we have to respond because it's, it's how else are we going to live a life with any kind of meaning if we don't respond? Well, and I, I also think bringing in the idea of karma can be very helpful or the, or even the, the concept of reincarnation in some ways, because you know, the, the resolution to some of this stuff will happen beyond our generation. And, and if, if we take that long view, you know, that, that we are part of everything so that there may be, you know, it may be years and years and we will not, we won't see it. It won't, it won't be in our experience of it. Yeah. And you know, listen, not one thing is going to happen. Right. One thing's going to happen in your family. Many things is going to happen in maybe your family or your circle. It, it, this is a world full of people having different experiences all the time. You know, how are we going to be a knower of that or a judger of that? This is the problem. This is, it's not the problem. It's the nature of things. Yeah. 
So all we can do is in our own sphere of understanding, look at the world and understand realistically that it resists definition. It resists like, all you can do is be so humble and like, I don't know this feel. And what I'm trying to say is the mind that is open and curious and humble is also more loving and creative and responsive. This is my experience. This, I, this, like I say, that the mind of questioning and listening, listening to others. Like I feel, and I'll say this, you know, maybe, you know, I am, you know, a white privileged person. And I think this is a time for me to shut up and listen. Yeah, I know I'm talking a lot right now, <laughs> but I, but I'm just, you know, yeah. I, I, you know, shut off my social media and I'm trying to hear what's going on. And I can't, un I'm not, I'll never understand it. I mean, no one will understand 100% anything. But this, you have to let it touch you. You know, you have to let it change you. You have, that. this is the Bodhisattva's act of bearing witness. And it requires an understanding of the absolute truth, you know. How are we going to let it touch us and change us and move us? And when we're able to bear witness, we will naturally respond to the world. Like, unless we can bear witness, how do we have that kind of creativity to know what to do? And it's not one thing. It's just every moment you think, what can I do? How can I serve? You know, it might be that you, you know, you can donate money or you can donate service or you can march in the street or you can talk to somebody or you can reach out. Sometimes you can just pray. Sometimes you can just be sad. Sometimes you could just grieve. Sometimes, you know, I don't know. You have to allow the natural creativity comes from the nature. We think, oh, we're the creative one. But actually, when you stop, when you kind of cut when you stop and you start to listen and start, like Mary Beth was saying, sometimes when you, you're trying to fix the world, it's so much about you. But when it stops being so much about you, it, all the creativity starts to come out. The intelligence, it's not even totally yours, you know. The, the world will make you do it. The situation will make you do it, you know. I, this is this is where I just think we get so stuck, you know, in this fixing thing, and, and and I think this is so important right now to talk about because I don't know. There's no time for complacency, you know. And I, there's only time to sanely in help and in a healthy way figure out how to to utilize everything we have for the benefit of others, you know. That will be a benefit to ourselves, you know, and that's, this is, we're just talking about bodhicitta. Yeah. But the aspect that's the feminine principle is that kind of strong bearing witness aspect, the ability to bear emptiness. That's, that's the feminine principle in Buddhism, because that's called the Prajnaparamita and the ability to connect the dots and see what's going to benefit. Prajnaparamita. The wisdom that goes beyond those extremes, you know. Om gate gate para gate para sam gate bodhisvaha. That's the, the wisdom that goes beyond the extremes. It's a whole different, it's stepping out of that, some system that's dualistic, that's binary. Into a different way. Is this making more sense, I hope? Yes, it's clear as mud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is a very challenging because I think we tend to, by your children, I think we tend to hear in streams to see things. We, we're not looking correctly at the problem of the human condition, the human mind, the habitual mind. I think one of the most difficult pieces of this, though, is the suffering that goes along with it and the pain that is inherent in bearing witness in agency and in response. I mean, uh, what do you think about that? Like, how do you work with the pain? Yes. 
So, so I think there's a healthy, you can feel pain in a healthy way. If you feel pain in a healthy way, it's compassion, <laughs> you know, healthy, your ability. It's like, sometimes I think we feel we can't bear it. We're like, life is too painful for us. Right. Life is too beautiful for us. Life is too complicated for us. That's where this, pra that's what this practice is about. How can we get bigger to accommodate and bear witness to more pain and beauty without shutting down and then responding? That's the Bodhisattva path, the Mahayana path, the foundation for the Vajrayana path. And it, it's, it's really a part of the Vajrayana path too. So, you know, when I think the unhealthy way to deal with pain is to try to fix and then fall into despair. To, to see that you can't fix it. You can't fix the world, but you can respond. And you, and it, you can, because you're a part of the nature of interdependence, you're powerful to respond. Right yeah. now, you can press a button and some money can go somewhere, or you can make a phone call and somebody who's having a really hard time, you can, you can soothe that. Can... Yes. Yes. Doesn't it help not to have a very fixed idea about yourself? Yeah, I think that's great. Because this fluid sense of be of who you are, of who I am, makes a big difference. If if I'm if I'm letting that go. Yeah. I think it's so true. Like we're so focused on the self. You know, I don't know if we could ever find a self that's one thing. You know, we that's what we talked about. But this idea of kind of protecting and cherishing the self all the time makes, makes it, um, makes us miserable. <laughs> I don't think that that's a, a healthy response to being part of the nature of interdependent relationships. It's like, we're just contracting into our own world and there's no meaning in that. There's only meaning in service, you know, there's only meaning in caring and loving others. And then if we're going to engage that world, if we want to serve others in a healthy way, we're going to have to learn to bear witness, you know, to the way things actually are. And, and this is Alyssa again. The bearing witness is also um, learning to be very gentle with our own experience of it and, and, and give it some space. I mean, that, that's what I've been finding is that it is kind of a roller coaster, you know, that I, I do have these strong feelings and I have to give it some space. I have to be, you know, sometimes it, it's helpful just to bake the cake, you know, and yeah. uh, <laughs> sometimes it's helpful to, to take that nap in the middle of the day. Oh. Um, and, and, and it's Go not ahead. the in indulgent piece, but the, and not the, um, retreating and you know pulling away from the world it's it's the noticing how difficult this really is this this warrior work of uh staying a, a, a witnessing and not knowing what is the next best thing until you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you never really know do you Alyssa? Be no then no. you do, you could have the best of intention. You don't know what's going to happen. And that's, again, you know, this, the mind that is, it has some humility, you know, the mind that does it, it's okay. It's actually a kind of wisdom to, to not know, basically. Yes. It's wisdom to see that life resists definition, that life resists us really knowing it in an act, as an actual truth, that the and not because like we're ignorant, but because the nature is changing and moving and dynamic. Right. That's all. So what this is saying is look at what the nature, let's look realistically at the nature of the phenomena. Now let's talk about how to navigate it, you know, because if it is, you know, and this is something we see with our own eyes. It's not like we have to look at even we could see this from our own experience that, that we can't fix things. We can't fix people. We can't necessarily always fix ourselves. We can't always fix our body. Sometimes we can, and we can influence and we can, but in the process of doing all this, we can also um, 
kind of it, contribute. We can contribute. Um, we can we can love. We can we can serve. We can help. And sometimes we fuck up. Excuse my French, but we we you know we don't we we're just all we can do is play in the best way that we can play. You know, we 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 can just have the best motivation. Um, and I feel this practice of bearing witness is a very powerful aspect of spirituality. And it really informs the work that we do in the world. So it protects us from fundamentalism and being totally passive and falling into meaninglessness. Those are the two extremes. You turn to the nihilism. And in fact, that's what we're being asked to do uh, by um, communities of color, particularly, is to huh. bear witness and not to huh. not to jump in to support as allies. Uh, you know, I've been seeing it in the meditation communities where you know people of color are ha having gatherings and not inviting us in, but in inviting us in to support as allies and financially. And you know, that's that's a you know, that's a very powerful, uh, I'll just sit with those feelings for a while and see if yeah. I can work with them because that, you know, it's, it is very powerful to be on the side of bearing witness. It's, it's you know, it's a, such an opportunity to have to, to not have to, but to, to allow even ourselves to listen when people are speaking out in a way that it needs to be heard. And I, I personally think this idea of listening and bearing witness, if we could do it all the time, it would be better. <laughs> if we could do it as much as possible, then we'll be also more intelligent. If we're all walking around like knowers, how can we even learn anything anyways? You know, I'm just, asking, this is what I just ask. This is like the feminine principle thing for me. You know, just notice your mind at its best. I I bet you you'll find that it's open, humble, curious, interested, you know, and responsive and loving all at once. Notice your mind at its worst, closed down, you know, right. You know, I I really when you talk to somebody who's always right, do you know that how that feels? I, it doesn't feel very engaging and there's no space for it like anyone else. And it, you want to run away. So when your mind is like that too, it's also, um, it's not the best of who we are. I think we need to examine like, what does that mean to really listen? You know, what does that mean to bear witness? I guess bear witness is more like the visual kind of idea. Listening is like the, you know, but it's the same thing. Bear witness, listen. I don't know. And I, I really think the Dharma is telling us, this is what the Dharma is asking us to do, that this is the practice. I have a question, Elizabeth. Yeah. When, you, when you're talking about bear witnessing in such an open way, are you including the learning and the reading that we need to do in order to bear witness as education, educated white people in the face of what our black brothers and sisters are saying? Because well, yeah. they don't want to be asked, so that yeah. we have to listen to them. Yeah. That is like, they're not teaching us black history. You know, that's like the worst yeah. thing we can do is ask them to do that for us. Yeah. So, Bear witnessing is a responsibility to also know when to ask and not to, and not to. Yeah. yeah. So that takes educational stuff because I think for me, I know I had to learn that the hard way. <laughs> I think I had to ask and then find out what that's I think for. we all are learning lessons, you know. I'm not an expert, you know, with this. I'm just, like, I'm just, you know, I've studied a lot of the Buddha Dharma in, 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 you know, I just actually talking about the feminine principle here, but it just so happens that it does, like you're saying, it, it corresponds with 
Yeah, I just, I just think this is a time for us to maybe in a certain way, just, you know, we'll be quiet and let this thing kind of touch us and change our DNA and change our, there's so much, I mean, I personally think this is how we just live right all the time. <laughs> you know, we should be touched by the world. We should be touched by people suffering. You know, this is this is what it's suggesting. You know, in the in the Dharma itself. So yeah, but I I do agree with you. It's like, well, maybe you know, this is part of that process, and then to educate ourselves is part of that process. And then sometimes we have friends and we have relationships and people who be willing to talk to us. Then that's good too. You know, I like I don't know how this is going to work out for every individual. You know, if there's, you know, I have some friends. Lots of friends who are people of color who some of them I have talked to about this, and it's been, I feel so grateful. And some of those people have called me out, you know, and believe me, many times, you know, things that I just, I'm being educated, you know. So either the world will educate you or you can educate yourself. It's all good. I, you know, read a lot of books and, um, or listen to audible audio books and, um, try to, um, humbly, um, but I, I think this is just all pointing to that aspect that we're talking about. I'm sure when you came to hear about the, you know, you thought I was going to talk about the feminine principle. It wasn't going to be about this, but so happens that in terms of what I know, this is what actually the feminine principle is. If you ask. Well, that's, that's great news. You know, yeah. this is like what we've been. So many of us have been working with throughout this whole situation. And, you know, p part of the not knowing and listening in and leaning in and all of that yeah. is also just be willing to, you know, to screw up, as you say, you know, like, OK, so maybe that doesn't define me. I, I don't have to define myself as an unknowing, you know, screw up of a, you know, understander. I could say, all right, well. You know, at this moment, this feels like this is a good move. And who knows what the what who knows what the ramifications of that are, but I'm certainly willing to look at that. Next, you know, the next step. Um Yeah. Yeah. I th I think this is just, you know, a way of, of going through life. Like I'm thinking, you know, my mom, I'm here in uh, where I live. My mom lives three miles away and my mom is dying right now. She's in hospice, you know. And I'm thinking, okay, all this stuff is happening in the world, you know. And it's, my mom is right now just reminding me, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, this is not a fixable situation that we're going to die. It's not a fixable situation, the aging and the sickness and the, just the human condition, the condition of all living beings, the condition of the, even the planet. I don't know. It just... You know, this is just all here for us to work with, you know. And I just think this is the most practical thing I can think of to um to be working with all of this, you know. I don't know what else to do with our life than to learn to be kind, to learn to be sensitive, to learn to bear witness, to learn to be big enough for our life, for the beauty and pain of it, you know. To me, that's evolution. Because I don't think as human beings, old age, sickness, and death is what I would call evolution. <laughs> but I think evolution means that we can be open and kind and we can be, uh, have that kind of courage, you know, and that kind of um, bravery. But it's all from wisdom because it's coming from wisdom because we're looking at the nature of how things are and how we have the agency to move about in it. You know, it's, it's a wisdom thing, this thing. We should stop soon, but John, why don't you say? John's back. I would like you to talk some, some about the bliss. That's one aspect of your discussion that I find lacking for some reason or other. Uh, yeah. We are very vocally on I, I have a state of mind. <laughs> With all the humility that I can can uh, uh, 
muster, my best state of mind is simply blissful. Yeah. And it's and it's blissful whether I'm uh treating extraordinary bias in healthcare against African Americans. I'm a doctor, I've experienced. Uh it's it's blissful if I uh take care of my grandson. It's quite blissful whenever I get into a Dharma gathering. Like for instance, right now, I have a bazillion questions and many even disagreements, but how I sit here, I feel blissful. But I don't hear you talk about that experience. Okay. Well, let me talk about that experience because it seems like uh, that, that is an important, I mean, like for me, that word is not as important. I think I tend to kind of lean toward the suffering a little bit <laughs> and be interested in the suffering. But I can understand what you're saying. Now, I've asked my teacher, you know, what is bliss? He says it's the absence of grasping and rejection. That's what I've been talking about here, you know? I, you, know you, can't, you can't find bliss despite suffering. You can't find true bliss despite suffering. That I'm really sure, you know? True bliss or true happiness that we're talking about can't be dis dismissing suffering. It has to be understanding the nature of suffering. So... I that I'm this, simply curious about phenomenon of the bliss yeah well you know they say about the bodhisattva this is what they say that the greatest fear of the bodhisattva is just to fall into a state of bliss you know they always say that like the bodhisattva is like a lotus floating on a muddy pond and it's always a danger to be attached to bliss however bliss might come incidentally if you're not grasping and rejecting you know maybe you know, leaning into the darker parts is the sad, the suffering also is bliss in the sense that it's not, it's not like you're driving on suffering, but it's that, I don't know, this idea of taking on the burden as a bodhisattva, it's so meaningful. So maybe you feel that bliss from that. Maybe that's what you're saying. I don't know. Okay. Well, I do. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I have a feeling you come much more from the Vajrayana view. I also am a, from a Vajrayana tradition, but I'm so grounded on the Bodhisattva path. The Bodhisattva path means everything to me. Then the practice of the Vajrayana is just, you know, it's a, it's just the skillful means is very powerful. But, but the view is, has to be rooted, grounded in the Bodhicitta. And the Bodhicitta is about leaning into the suffering, you know, about, le le uh, you, it's so, you know, we don't want to get caught in bliss that we start to spiritually bypass the suffering of the world. That's a danger. That's an extreme also. Yeah, I, I understand that. Yeah, I, I bet you do. I, I have a feeling you've been practicing for a long time. Every time you did, every time you asked us to imagine our best self, you talked about um, us being open and curious. And so when he asked about bliss, I thought you were going to say bliss is the, like the, the, the a feeling when you have that ability to stay open. Yeah. Regardless of the level of suffering that's around you. Yeah. And maybe you see, this is all semantics. Like John likes the word bliss. And of course, when it comes to talking about feminine energy, you know, the word bliss is always coming up. And, uh, you know, especially in the Vajrayana, not in the Mahayana so much, you know, it often comes up. Um, but you know, I could say that's bliss for me when my mind is not grasping and rejecting, when my mind is curious and open, when I'm able to bear witness to the suffering of the world. Maybe I, maybe I could say that that's bliss in the sense that, but it's not bliss like it just, everything is right for me in that way. My mind is in the right order with the world in which it lives. And that maybe you can say is bliss. You know, did, did I know who I am in the context of the world that I move about in or something that might you say is bliss, you know, it's just at wellness, it's extreme wellness. And it sometimes it's not a lot, 
you know, and then I'm struggling and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort it out and I'm trying to figure out how to work with it. You know, I'm just, I feel I'm very much a student. That's how I see myself very much a student that way. But isn't, couldn't you also think about bliss in terms of the ordinary magic? You know, when we can kind of say, wow, I just lost myself in an hour of, you know, preparing a meal and noticing the shapes of the carrot slices I just cut. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and for me, you know, um, connecting to this feminine wisdom, you know, in some ways is actually this very ordinary, um, very humbling um experience of actually coming back to, you know, some of the ways of my ancestors, like hanging a load of laundry on the line, you know, and I think, so for me, it's those moments of, of, of touching into these experiences. They're very ordinary. There's nothing quite special about them at all, but they have some intrinsic, um, realness and a, and an intrinsic relationship to you know every woman who ever hung a line of clothes you know and yeah, any ancestor who ever you know baked a cake you know I, and 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 you know what it took to bake a cake you know yeah. it takes it takes me getting over my fear of baking a cake you know it took my ancestors you know, hours to stoke a stove to bake a cu- cake, you know? Yeah. So, and if you think, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I'm done. Yeah. No, I think actually the idea that things arise interdependently, but when you look for them, you can't exactly find them. Intrinsic in and of themselves is very magical. And that's why, and, and maybe this is a good way to wrap this up, because I do think that this is a way of seeing the world in a very magical place. I'm not saying also there's no pain there, you know, I'm not trying to skip over anything, but even suffering and happiness and beauty, all of it arises based on causes and conditions and expresses itself and dissolves. So they say like, it's like a rainbow, you know, a rainbow arises based on causes and conditions like why, you know, moisture and sun and light and whatever, however, you know, it is explained scientifically. But when you try to, locate a rainbow or touch a rainbow, you can't really find it. So Nagarjuna says like, everything is like a dream. It's like a rainbow. It's like a mirage. It's like an echo or a magical display. Like it's presenting itself, but not intrinsically there. Um, so they call this mere appearance that it, that, that our life is like that. So in a way you don't reify or get too attached or concretize And yet you can enjoy, like a rainbow is so vivid and it's so beautiful. And suffering is like that too. Like it's so, you know, we can't exactly say it's real, but it is real and that it's experienced and it arises due to causes and conditions. It expresses itself and it falls away. So in that, but it's experienced, it's a real experience for people. It's a real vivid, painful thing. And so these two things are not separate. They're in union. You know, you see in the, in the Tonka, you know, male and female, it, that's the symbol of emptiness and appearance. And so, you know, things arise, things are empty because they, they're interdependent. And because they're interdependent and because they're empty, they can arise. And this is, you know, when we hear in the heart search, you're like, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, form is no other than emptiness emptiness and no other than form. This is what it's speaking to. Um, it's speaking to, so yes, in a way, everything's magical. You know, everything, like you can look at anything and say, wow, man, how did that happen? You know, it, like Carl Sagan, speaking of like cakes, Carl Sagan says, if you want to make an apple pie, you're going to have to invent the whole universe. Because in the apple pie, like you had an original seed that became an original seed. And then you need a tractor and where does the metal come and the gas and the people, who, the farmers. And once you start looking at what it takes to make an apple pie, you have a whole universe involved. And so it's magical this, to see this. It's magical, but that doesn't also mean there's not a whole lot of pain. 
and a whole lot of suffering. And what are we going to do about that? And how do we respond? You know, and so you know, it's this whole other way of seeing things that's really beautiful and poignant and difficult and hard to reconcile in a certain way. But this, the path of the Bodhisattva is a way to do that. So, you know, I might, you know, I realize like I'm, I got into something that, you know, Prajna Paramita is it for me. Like I'm really, really devoted to this understanding of this practice. So if you ask me to come and teach the feminine principle, I'm only going to be talking about emptiness and interdependence, you know, that's, that's me. I'm like a real hardcore Mayana path of the Bodhisattva person. So, you know, that's what I've shared with you today. And I really hope that it's practical. Like I really hope because I really hope that anyways, it can support in some way um, something I'll just your responsiveness, you know, to what's happening in the world right now and in your well-being and the well-being of others. And I, I really pray for that. And I, uh, yeah, I wish everyone so much kind of love and um, good fortune, you know. Um, I'm right with you, <laughs> too. So, yeah, thanks so much, everybody, um, for spending, you know, Thank you. 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 My pleasure. Perfect really teaching good. tonight. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Time. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. I learned so much. It was a great talk. Thank you so much. Michelle from Seattle, Washington. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Mad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's beautiful. Oh, well, maybe there's more. Hopefully, hopefully, when this uh, uh, separation of screens is done, you'll come back to Philadelphia. I would love to come and to help you and see you and hear you. Yeah, Anand Tukton likes my cooking. <laughs> oh, does he? And, well, I'm sure it's good. Oh, yeah. Ask him about pasta. <laughs> yeah. Oh, beautiful. Oh, yeah. I'd love that. But, uh, you know, uh, the, whole, the whole wisdom seed actually with uh, our fundamental purpose comes from uh, my root teacher, Trungpa Rinpoche. And Michael Carroll, and uh, actually every member of the Wizard Seat, though they have root gurus, Trungpa Rinpoche is a very uh, key. And I know your teacher, Zigar uh, Kanjuru Rinpoche, and uh, they met when Dilgo Kenze Rinpoche came. So this connection is really, really important, and I so appreciate it. It's actually uh, a fellow Vajra brother said to me, uh, he accepted teaching from Anand Tupton, and he said, uh, you know, I went to something Elizabeth taught, and she was really impressed. So that made me uh, want to reach out to you. So thank you very much for willing. And so rapidly, you responded to my email within two hours. Oh, cool. really? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, he's a good kid. I'm happy to make this connection. It's wonderful, um, you know, what you're doing and the teachers you bring in. I so appreciate it. And the, the Dharma is a powerful thing. And, and, you know, I think we need to take the Dharma and really, oh. you know, it's relevant. I mean, the Dharma is always relevant to, to me, but it's like it's always a process of making it more and more relevant because the Dharma has this wisdom that's kind of always true, but the the times are changing and the language is changing and then the situation's changing and just continuously talking all of us to see how we can just keep it alive in us and keep in benefit others is, is so important, you know? So it couldn't have well, been a thank you time. for, uh, thank you, Matt. Allowing us to, uh, listen to living paradox. <laughs> <laughs> 
we have that work with living paradox. So yeah, I think uh, if that's it for everyone, we can say good night. Okay. I'm just wondering about recording. Are we going to have access to the recording? I mean, I don't mind. You can uh, have it. Yeah, I I don't mind. However, you guys feel if you want it, for free. Feel free, mm -hmm. use it. <laughs> Thank well, you all. Lots of love. Lots of love. Right. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.